and you're welcome back to the programme. The late Albert Reynolds served as Taoiseach from early 1992 till late in 1994, and though his tenure in office was short, he achieved much, particularly in the context of the North. Albert Reynolds, Risk Taker for Peace, has just been published. Its author is the former Minister Conor Lenehan, who joins me now. Uh, Conor Lenehan, good evening to you, and you're very welcome indeed to the programme. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Can I say at the outset that it's uh, compliments, first of all, and it's eminently readable, uh, to say the very least of it, particularly for people who may have lived during the uh, Reynolds era, because you you get another slant on on the life of this man, not just the private, but also the public. Yeah, well, the idea really was to get a a real insight into his personality and the kind of person he was. And I was fortunate enough, uh, both as a journalist and then again later in politics and during the peace process itself, to be an intermediary working with him directly. So... I got to know him quite well, and that was the big priority for me in the book, to share with the the reader an insight into his personality. If we can perhaps concentrate on his uh, career in politics, he was elected in 1977. Uh, People will remember the uh, overall majority secured by Jack Lynch. Uh, Within two years, he was uh, a government minister with responsibility for posts and telegraphs. Many people might think that he was uh, moving fast as as a, a politician, but in fact, you make reference to uh, the time in question, and he actually said he was very surprised that he was elevated to ministerial rank and initially thought that he was uh, being parliamentary secretary. That's right, and I think he'd been a long-time supporter of Charles Hawhey in, in his period in the wilderness, but... He was very highly regarded by Hawhey and indeed my, my late father as a minister because he came with this very strong reputation as a business person in the music promotion business and then in, in food, bacon and other things and then obviously pet food. So he came as a rather unusual latecomer to the political scene, but somebody that the older crew that were not so much older than them but were there longer viewed as a person as, with superb executive and business skills. So not only was he made a minister in 79 for Post and Telegraphs, as you rightly say, he got added responsibility for transport after only a few months in the job. So around the cabinet table at the time, he was highly regarded as a very effective minister or executive, if you like. And, of course, there was a an influx of people there from 1977, including our own Porrick Flynn and uh, Ray McSharry. Uh, they, they were, you know, ambitious politicians over the course of the next couple of years, then 18 months, there were these three uh, general elections in close succession. What was what was Reynolds' view of Charles Hawhey at the end of those when they went into opposition? I think it, it, he says this in his own autobiography, which is kind of interesting. He, he was a very independent-minded person. He, he told Hawhey after he supported him for the last of these attempted heaves against Hawhey in those periods that you're talking about in the 80s, that he couldn't really depend on his support after that, that he wasn't going to be going out fighting, you know, hand-to-hand combat, if you like, for him in these internal party feuds that were so much part of the picture when Hawhey's leadership was being contested by Des O'Malley, George Colley and others. So he was quite a straightforward, candid sort of person. He, he expressed very forcibly what was on his mind or what his concerns were. And that, that was not particularly typical of the time either, you know. Because people were, I think it's fair to say, quite afraid of Charles Hawhey. But it has to be said as well that Reynolds was independently wealthy. He he wasn't relying on politics to turn a crust. And he was very forceful in what he was prepared to say to to Charles Hawhey. Well, that's right. He was really, I mean, quite extraordinary because, I mean, obviously a lot of people were afraid of Hawhey. Uh, and on one occasion, he was going to give the industry and commerce portfolio to Ray Burke rather than to... Uh, Albert Reynolds and Albert Reynolds said he would offer something less than what he felt he deserved and, and would be effective at and he basically told Hoy I'm not taking that job I have enough things on my plate with my own business I, I'm not going to sign on for that and Hoy promptly panicked changed his mind and gave him 
uh, the industry and commerce uh, portfolio. This is when the government uh, was formed in 1987. Charles Hawhey had uh, failed to get that elusive overall majority, but nonetheless he put together a minority government. And I was reading in, in, in your book that your father was a close advisor to uh, Charles Hawhey and said, look, at rule as though you've got that overall majority. That's right. The idea was, I mean, the key people here were Ray McSharry and to Albert Reynolds and then obviously my father in the Anglo-Irish affairs where Pahi in opposition had opposed the Anglo-Irish agreement, but they were now going to implement it in government. And then McSharry was running the economy side of things. And again, uh, Pahi had flip-flopped in the earlier period, but they were going to input and, and do some fairly draconian cuts, if you like, to public spending and the like. And so... Uh, yeah, there were tough-minded people around Hawaii who were, who at that stage were not prepared to take much more nonsense on the economy or indeed on Northern Ireland, and they took charge of things in that sense. Now, I think it's fair to say as well that while uh, Reynolds was carrying out his ministerial job, he and your father were becoming key strategists in the endless drift within Fianna Fáil between the pro- and anti hahi factions. That's right, yeah. Uh, Albert was quite a strategist and obviously was very media friendly. He'd owned a, a local newspaper. He, you know, he was quite savvy when it came to how to handle media and how to move, the, you know, if you like, the sentiment or in a particular direction. So, yeah, he was he was quite skilled at what was called back there, plotting, if you like, that sometimes forms an important part of parliamentary life. So he was, he was a very effective operator and... Uh, I think really the way or the path to power him was very much cleared when Des O'Malley, one of the leading potential contenders to replace how he uh, left Fianna Fáil. So he, he got a, a, a significant opportunity to potentially look at himself as being a Taoiseach someday. Yeah, because um, by 1987, when he did become Minister for Industry and Commerce, by that time, he had become a formidable player within the party. And, you know, his um, his leadership ambitions may not have been taken seriously throughout much of the 80s. But by the end of the 80s, when he was minister, uh, they were uh, becoming much more prominent. Yeah, the big uh, turning point for him in terms of expectation, as in a realistic expectation of becoming leader, was when Ray McSharry unexpectedly cho- chose to become European Commissioner. McSharry would have been the leader had he stayed on, but he moved off to become appointed to the European Commission. And Albert Reynolds, to his own uh, surprise, was made Minister for Finance. And, and that really was, you know, he became, in effect, uh, an heir apparent at that point, or potentially certainly one, because, uh, you know, uh, McSharry, who would have been the, the significant contender, had, had, had disappeared off the scene. Yeah, you quote the economist uh, Colin McCarthy, and he was at that point with uh, DKM. Uh, McCarthy said in relation to Reynolds' appointment, he'd be taken seriously. Of all the guys available, Albert Reynolds would command the most confidence as Minister for Finance. That's right. And there had been some uh, fevered speculation as to who would replace McSharry, of which Paul Finn was one of the leading contenders. And I think um, at that point in time, uh, Charles Hawley trusted Flynn more perhaps than Reynolds. But my late father and a man called Peter Hanley from Ruski uh, exerted great influence in terms of uh, securing the position for Reynolds, whom they believed would be credible in the role. At the time, the economy was fragile. It was coming out of a period of austerity, potential for economic growth. And they felt very strong, my father in particular, that it, it needed to be somebody who was credible with the business community uh, who would be appointed to the Department of Finance. And I think it's fair to say that Albert Reynolds, as Minister for Finance, didn't have to pursue the same policies of austerity which um, Mar- Mark McSherry, who's in the news, obviously, which Ray McSherry pursued getting the, the, the name Mac the Knife. That's correct, yeah. yeah. Well, Ray McSherry had done a lot of the heavy cutting. There was now, thanks to the work of Ray McSherry, there was a little bit of leeway or a little bit of play in the Exchequer Finances to actually contemplate opening up, reducing taxes and, and what we would call more traditional non-austerity, but economic expansion. So, to some extent, Reynolds was lucky, but he, he, he certainly acquitted himself well in the role of Minister for Finance. And, of course, unusually for a Minister for, for Finance, um, 
Reynolds moved into overdrive. Uh, he started uh, moving from constituency to constituency, speaking engagements, uh, not something most ministers do. And, you know, suddenly within 10 years or maybe 11 years, he was then second in command. And by then he certainly saw himself as uh, leader of the party in Taoiseach. That's right. In fact, in, in one section of it, with the, the book I write, the fact that he, he reckoned to be doing 80,000 miles a year in terms of, you know, visits to the, the classic party meetings, Chamber of Commerce meetings all around the country. So he had this ex- extraordinary diary. I remember it myself as a journalist covering that he, he was speaking from all the corners of the country, attending these rallies, meetings, you know, gatherings of one kind or the other where he was an advice or a guest speaker. So he, he really put the hard work in, but he essentially did what Hawley had done in his wilderness years, but did it in the space of a year or two or three, you know. And in relation then, Connor, to the general election in 1989, uh, Charles Hawley called this election in the belief that he would get that elusive overall majority. I think your father was urging him not to do so. Others were saying go for it. But of course, he failed once again to secure that overall majority. But uh, extraordinarily, Fianna Fáil got 77 seats in that election, the PDs six, and suddenly there was the possibility of this extraordinary matchup between Charles, Charles Hawley and his old enemy, uh, Desmond O'Malley. That's right, and, and again, some of the disillusionment that Reynolds experienced with Hawley was attributable to this period where Hawley outflanked his own negotiators, his principal negotiators of the coalition deal with the Progressive Democrats, Roberta Hearn and Albert Reynolds, and they heard on the radio that actually Hawley had already made the concession with regard to the number of cabinet seats that the uh, PDs would enjoy uh, in a direct discussion negotiation over the heads of his own negotiators directly between him and O'Malley. So that, that left a kind of sour taste in the mouth for both Albert and uh, Bertie Hearn, but Albert felt perhaps more than, than Bertie. In 1990, of course, there was the presidential election and your father was the uh, Fianna Foyle candidate there. But Albert Reynolds used the election campaign uh, in a way to his own benefit because um, he decided that this would be an opportunity for him to build some support among his uh, parliamentary colleagues. Yes, that's right. Yeah, there was a there was there, there was a kind of a nomination process to get nominated to run for the presidency, and of course, Albert took a bet on on the John Wilson candidacy. John Wilson, of course, was a deputy for Calvin, very distinguished man, Minister for Education. And and that was almost like a trial run from uh, Albert's perspective to see what level of support he could uh, uh, engineer from the parliamentary party, which would then go on to support him in any kind of subsequent leadership bid. And tell the story about uh, Reynolds uh, leaving government buildings uh, very, very fast indeed in his ministerial Mercedes in order to catch up with uh, a campaign that was now gripped uh, in many respects by a, a serious crisis. He abandoned the, the state car and ministerial driver apparently and sat himself down beside you on the campaign bus. Yes, it was in the Midlands. Yeah, we, I think I think we, 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 we actually arrived by train in Longford and he arrived with us and, you know, just to make things more convenient and stay with the group, he he jumped on the bus and sat down beside me. And I, I didn't, to be honest with you, I knew of him rather than uh, knew him very well. And we sat on the bus for hours on end. He would jump out of the bus with my father and make a speech in a town hall or a village gathering. And yeah, he was a very interesting man. He was very easy to talk to. I was a much younger person at that stage, obviously. And he was much more senior, in a sense, to me in age and other terms. So it was actually very nice to be able to sit beside the bus and talk to him on a level and that's the one thing that really struck me all his life that he was amenable and open to talk to almost anybody he didn't discriminate in terms of who he spoke to which was something that made him I think significantly popular in many parts of the country you know and of course that probably would have been because of his earlier career you know he was a clerk I think with CIE and then moved into the dance hall business and uh, you couldn't be haughty taughty if you were going to be a success in that particular business whereas those around Charles Hawley and Charles Hawley himself you know look more or less looked down their their noses on the likes of Albert Reynolds and of course Albert Reynolds and others became the uh, country and western set yeah, well, the country and western set was particularly ironic because 
I started using that as almost like a smear on Reynolds when he became a direct threat to his own position. So it was a rather strange thing for a sitting leader of a party to be depicting his internal enemies in those terms because pretty much all of them, including Paul Flynn and many of the others who were supporting Reynolds, had actually put Hawley into his job uh, when he was competing against Jack Lynch. So it was a kind of profound irony in Hawley turning on some of his best supporters and depicting them as kind of being sort of hilly billings or country hicks of one kind or the other. I mean, that's what's being said. So it was a rather damaging narrative uh, for everybody uh, in that party at that time to be deploying. But uh, Reynolds got over it and got on with things, you know. And of course, by early 1991, Hahi himself was now aware that his Minister for Finance was seriously interested in Hahi's job. And I think um, over the summer of 1991, Porrick Flynn toured the country talking to TDs to get support for Reynolds. So had they made this strategic decision that um, Charles Hahi himself then had to be removed from office? I think that had been decided, yeah. I think a lot of people were becoming, I suppose, increasingly disillusioned with how how he performed and behaved in power, and uh, they decided to take matters into their own hand, and that was really Reynolds' work, along with Paul Flynn and many others. You know, they decided they were going to have to stage a contest to have um, how he removed as leader and replaced him uh, with Albert Reynolds. So it was, and I was a journalist covering all of this, and it was very, very interesting to see the different manoeuvres of one kind and the other in the effort to do exactly that. But of course, I was assailed by scandals, business scandals in his last 18 months in politics. So it was a very thorough affair and very swift. And towards the end of 1991, Connor, in November, I think, Sean Power, a very young deputy from Kildare, put forward a motion of no confidence in Hahi. And at that point, Reynolds' campaign really had to come to an end in many respects because, you know, he would have to come off the fence. He had to get off the fence. I don't think he was keen on the motion in particular. I think he preferred it done another way, but they were all forced himself and several other cabinet members resigned, and they resigned about six of them, three junior, three senior, and they did it in a timed way, in a timed and planned way to build up momentum for the challenge. But most of the parliamentary party didn't like uh, getting rid of Hawhey in this way, so they kind of temporarily didn't uh, uh, lend their support to the people trying to pull Hawhey. But then that changed very swiftly when, you know, uh, Hawhey was caught in further scandals and troubles, namely from uh, Sean Doherty and Roscommon, and that and that that then triggered another contest where it had been said by Albert rather confidently after the when he was defeated in that uh, he he had told some of his supporters not to openly pledge their their votes at the, on this occasion. And in fairness to Charles Hawhey, he won he won that vote. Um, it was a public show of hands, it has to be said, but uh, by 55 votes to 22. Um, and an earlier vote uh, to hold an open ballot was won by 44 to 33. So Hawhey was still there. Hawhey was still there. I think w- what happened was that the the Reynolds bid and, and, and with cohorts and other people in the parliamentary was so obviously a power bid that it kind of it, 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 it caused a certain amount of um, resentment in the ranks. But uh, like many of these things, the timing is often the wrong time. And a lot of people didn't want to have it on the set of them that they had been contributing to the rather sudden and, and very ruthless departure of the leader. And, and the idea was that if you gave high time, he would, in his own time, uh, depart the scene. And there was that talk, even in in, in the party, that, that, that they should ease him out rather than, if you like, ruthlessly take him out. Uh, but Reynolds and his, 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 his allies and friends thought that you would never uh, ease Hawhey out. He didn't believe that this was a man that would actually lend himself to some arrangement where he'd ease out of the job. And then in early 1992, uh, it wasn't uh, the, the Fianna Fáil Parliamentary Party that brought down Charles Hawhey, but a, a, a television interview by uh, Sean Doherty, and of course at a time when the RTE newsroom was on strike. That's right. It was huge. Um, what happened there was that the, the Sean Doherty um, press conference was, was, was relayed live because the, many of the news executives, rather than the the line journalists had to carry that comment. So this kind of magnified its live effect 
uh, of the announcement and press conference by Sean Doherty about the revelations in relation to phone tapping. And this sort of magnified the drama. The only other people who were able to broadcast it were actually independent stations like your own. I was working for 98FM and Ireland Radio News at the time. It was very dramatic because we, we were the only people who who were the country was listening to for news because we could still do our thing. We weren't and didn't have strikes at the time, but RT was on strike. So the importance of local media became hugely important as this particular crisis for high and, of course, opportunity for Reynolds played out. He was elected Taoiseach on the 11th of February 1992. He went to Oris and to get his seat of office from Mary Robinson. And then he returned to uh, Leinster House and it's been described, and you refer to it in your book, it was the St. Valentine's Week Massacre. Gone were Jerry Collins, Michael O'Kennedy, Ray Burke, Mary O'Rourke, Rory O'Hanlon, Vincent Brady, Noel Davern, and Brendan Daly from Clare. Um, getting getting Reynolds the name, uh, the Longford Slashers, after the, the GA club in that county. Yes, it was an extraordinary day to be in the dole because many of the correspondents, myself included, were standing or sitting in, in the press gallery watching as disappointed senior ministers took their place in the chamber for the for the formal announcement of the ministers. And we were all quite shocked that these very senior people, including Jerry Collins, were taking up seats uh, not in the front benches but in the back benches. It was uh, an extraordinary dramatic day. But I think it was it was Reynolds' way saying, you know, that he was going to run uh, the government firmly and with his own people and not rely on some of the people who had become very wedded or devoted to or loyal to to how he wanted to, I suppose, draw a line in the fan and to state up very clearly that he was in charge now and was different people uh, that would be running the show. And of course then back into government came Porrick Flynn, Michael Smith and Moira Gagan Quinn who had been fired from government in the power struggle with Charles Hockey. And only only a few months prior. So it wasn't they didn't have long out there. But I think this helped Reynolds' campaign because we're having all those people on the back benches rather than tied up as ministers meant his campaign uh, was was hugely more effective because they weren't tied up with their ministerial duties and, and the need to be loyal to the, the incumbent Taoiseach or leader, you know. And in fairness as well, in came Joe Walsh, David Andrews, Seamus Brennan and Charlie McCreevy, who were noted anti uh deputies. That's right. He was putting a very strong emphasis on that this was very different. These were different people who had not been given an opportunity to serve at a senior level under Hawaii and that he was going to give them that opportunity. And there were also obviously significant allies in terms of swaying TD support towards him and in his direction. So, yeah, he, he definitely was drawing a line on in the sand in terms of the, the past and the present. And it was, it was, a, it was a significantly brave move of the like of which I don't think we've ever seen before in terms of the clear out of ministers. I want to talk to you specifically about uh, his commitment to the North because you had your own role in that. But before we go there, uh, Connor. In 1992, only a matter of days after he took office, abortion was back on the front pages uh, and certainly promising to be one of the biggest issues to confront him in his in his administration. Um, and this was, of course, the X case. That's right. It just it just cascaded. Actually, I think he was over with John Dyden in a car speeding towards number 10 Downing Street when it crackled over the news uh, that, you know, this case had happened. And he, I don't think he got an opportunity to rest or settle in as T-shirt, this crisis became a huge crisis about a young woman, uh, apparently legally and otherwise being challenged about her right to, to go and travel and have a, an abortion operation in the UK. So this was a huge issue and it, it came as a kind of inflection point when people in Ireland were becoming more liberal and secular in their thinking. And, you know, this seemed to people uh, as something of a travesty type of case. And... Uh, it was a very tricky and difficult issue to negotiate and navigate from Reynolds' perspective, but he ended up then running three referenda on the issue, one on what's called a substantial issue, and the other two on the right to travel and the right to information. He got two of the three passed, but the, the one on the substantial matter of having uh, uh, and dealing either preventing abortion was was was, was voted down. So it was, it, was, it, it, it was a partial victory from to resolve it in that way, but it took up so much time and there was a huge amount of emotion around it as well. 
Uh, we'll talk uh, presently about the circumstances surrounding his departure from from office, but the the Attorney General at the time was Harry Whelan, Whelahan, and it was Harry Whelahan who took the decision in his own independent role as law officer to apply for an injunction to prevent the parents and the girl from travelling to Britain. And of course, this created its own controversy that the Attorney General was making this move rather than anybody else. Yes, and, and in fact, John Dignan he, he talks about this very realistically from his position as the government press secretary in his, in his own book. The issue was that everybody in the political scene wanted the abortion issue to go away, and they were all slightly wondering why he didn't act in a more political way. Uh, but of course, he is a law officer of the state and had unique obligations, and this was brought to his attention. So he felt that he had to confront this issue and deal with it and have it resolved legally. Of course, this set sort of liberals against conservatives and humanitarians against, you know, it, it was an extraordinary uh, convulsive controversy. And of course, uh, there's no suggestion that, that Mr. Whelan was acting in any other way other than somebody who felt that the legal issue had to be resolved. Uh, but uh, obviously it, it came at a very difficult time for everybody. And there wasn't, in a sense, at the time, as we've seen with the removal of the Eighth Amendment in recent years, there wasn't the willingness politically or otherwise to tackle this matter at the time. So opinion was quite divided. And as I say, in, in due course, we'll talk about um, his his... Well, his departure from office at the end of 1994, but his commitment to the North, uh, Connor, where would that have come from? I think it came from a very practical sense in his case, because, you know, Longford is quite close to the border. There is a, a stronger awareness of that part of the country than perhaps you might have in Munster or somewhere. You know, it's quite close, and I think it's very telling. Benny Reid, a very good friend of Albus, told me that when he came down uh, on the tour of the constituency that happened after becoming Taoiseach and leader, he pointed uh, from the village of Ockley Cliff, which is quite close in, in North Longford to the border, that he intended to solve that problem of North and stop the bloody carnage. It was an off the cuff remark, probably enough reporter at the time. But it did strike uh, Benny Reid, certainly, uh, that this is quite significant. But most Germans, because he had no footprint of being a kind of, how would you call it, a, a Republican minded person in terms of his spoken speeches and statements. Most people didn't really factor in that this could be an issue that he personally was very strongly in favour of resolving. But he had that personal commitment and he, he brought that about when he was in office and was lucky to the extent that the talks between Hume and Adams had already begun in 1988 and there was a feeling in the undergrowth that something might now be possible. And I think Reynolds just went for it. He decided, I'm going to really redouble and, and help and steer this thing towards a peaceful course. And of course, it was fortuitous that uh, John Major was the British PM at the time. Yeah, well, Major, and he had this extraordinary um, extraordinary relationship for, for the heads of two governments, British or Irish, because he met him in finance and they liked each other and both of them had been preceded by much uh, robust and stronger figures in Thatcher and Hawthorne. And neither of them had the benefit of third-level education. They didn't come from central casting in the Tory party are in Fianna Fáil. They were slightly different, more independent-minded people. And this seems to have assisted the relationship between uh, Reynolds and Major. And uh, it, it was really an extraordinary thing. It's covered well in John Major's autobiography and, of course, in, in, in Albert's autobiography. It, the relationship was one of great trust. And really, if you're to resolve anything in Anglo-Irish affairs, so there'll be the you know, the Brexit difficulties. Now, you de- need to have a very high level of trust in the picture between those two people who occupy the post of Taoiseach and Prime Minister to really get things done. And uh, Reynolds certainly had that relationship which allowed him to fight pu- both publicly and privately with Major, but not to be rancorous as a result. So there were strong fights during this process between Major and Reynolds, but it, they never let it slip over into being something more personalised than that. And within a few months of being elected Taoiseach, his popularity was very strong among the general public. You you make reference to one particular opinion poll at the time showing Fianna Fáil on 50% uh, of the vote and the PDs who were in government, of course, with, with him at that point, on a paltry 4%. That's right. And, and that seemed to feed into a kind of a certain, we call it hubris on Fianna Fáil part, that they could do what they like with regard to the PDs because they were electorally 
and politically vulnerable because of those low opinion polls that that perhaps uh, uh, they wouldn't be uh, part of the picture. And so therefore, some of the calculations and judgment calls in relation to the beef tribunal and other things, that they didn't care, you know, that there was a thing like this in doubt, leave them out, which was said by um, uh, Brian Town. And then obviously, uh, Albert himself talked about a temporary little arrangement. So this kind of became a feedback loop uh, between the two parties. But the pre-Ds, for their own part, because of this dispute in the beef tribunal, decided to short-circuit everything and push it to the wire and, and cause an election. And of course, in that election, towards the end of 1992, Fianna Fáil went into it with 77 seats, uh, came back, I think, with 68 uh, what was this? What were the circumstances then that uh, many people thought that uh, there would not be a, a Labour uh, involvement with Fianna Fáil because Dick Spring at the time had been very critical of the the Taoiseach. That's right. An extraordinary set of events occurred. The election happened. Fianna Fáil got a drubbing, but also, strangely, the main opposition party, Fine Gael, also suffered a loss. And Labour were negotiating with Bruton, but there have been previous history between Bruton and Spring, and you know they weren't each other's best fans or friends. And, and those discussions broke down. And into the middle of this, uh, Albert Reynolds was negotiating in Edinburgh for a significant transfer of EU funds to Ireland, and did an incredible job where he got eight. He left Edinburgh with eight billion rather than the six billion people expected. We might guess, and in fact, some people thought we'd get less than six. So it was an extraordinary result, and it coincided with the poisoning of the wells between uh, Gale and Labour. And Labour uh, were the recipient of an offer that they couldn't simply refuse. Martin Mansour wrote up a document while Albert was in Edinburgh, posted it to the Labour Party. And, you know, every item of policy that they promised and talked about in the election was being delivered by Fianna Fáil. So there wasn't a, a significant row over what the programme for government would be. And then Albert came back with a significant amount of money uh, from Brussels. And, you know, the whole situation changed. I mean, literally for Reynolds, he was probably before Edinburgh facing the chop as leader of Fianna Fáil after such a disastrous election. But then he was now seen as viable and, you know, uh, in a position uh, to form a government, but also to form a government with, with a limited amount of resourcing coming from Brussels. And which was uh, hugely beneficial to him. Your own role behind the scenes in the context of the North and the uh, interactions between uh, the then Taoiseach Alba Reynolds and senior players uh, in the North. Yeah, well, I became a, sort of dragged into that because my father's illness, who had been well, and he'd been doing some of it already for Reynolds, and then Reynolds himself was a friend of mine, so uh, it ended up in a very, and I have to emphasize this, it wasn't a major intermediate role or anything like that. It was it was more a matter of passing on messages that people felt was important to <clears throat> communicate or pass on. So that, that was my role. I don't like to over-exaggerate that because there are far more important people <clears throat> than me doing the same thing, but, but, but in a more significant way, like Father Alec Reid and Archbishop Eames and many others, you know, so I, I don't want to overstate that, but it, it gave me a great insight into Reynolds and his whole technique and how he operated, and uh, I was very impressed. Can, just to go back to the the Beef Tribunal, and of course when that report was published, uh, it gave rise to all sorts of difficulties, but um, you, you were very friendly with the late Supreme Court Judge Adrian Hardiman, and um, just for the benefit of listeners, uh, Adrian Hardiman cross-examined Albert Reynolds in the context of the Beef Tribunal, and you, to, to quote yourself, it was uh, stirring stuff. It was, it was, and, and, and unfortunately for Reynolds at the time, and this may account for some of the, the, the fall in his credit rating when an, an actual election was called, that he hadn't performed and didn't, and definitely was perceived not to have performed well in this evidence that he gave to the Beef Tribunal. Uh, it also was the case, I think, that John Bruton made this point, that this was an election that nobody had called for, or there was no public demand for an election. So sometimes I think politically you get punished if you if you create an unnecessary event like an election. So uh, Reynolds did very badly in that election. Uh, and I think the, we, we, what we call the interrogation by our, our cross-examination by 
by Adrian Hardiman didn't help things. Hardiman was a very brilliant barrister, a very adept at using and deploying language to either entrap a witness or to seek or get an admission from him. To be honest, Baines looked edgy and defensive throughout his testimony, and that, that was reflected then in the coverage, you know, which then obviously fed a, a kind of a feeling that perhaps he had been guilty of doing untoward or helped, overly helpful to the Goodman organisation and other beef companies in terms of export credit. So it, it didn't pass off well for him, and then, as I say, it ended up in an election. And then to to move ahead um, to towards the end, it, it came about as a result of the Brendan Smith affair. Just remind uh, listeners uh, what that was all about. And looking back now from this remove, it seems extraordinary that it brought down the government. It did, and Brendan Smith said it's the little things that trip you yes. up. You know that he'd, he'd scaled quite a few things, including the peace, securing an IRA ceasefire, and then a loyalist ceasefire. So. That was his own sense of it. And in fact, when I sat down to confront this issue as an issue for a reader to understand it, I had to change my mind and give two chapters to this one incident because it's very complicated, involves very complicated ideas about what is a justifiable delay in an extradition case. And in this case, Father Brendan Smith had been a paedophile priest going back many, the, the past 20, 30 years, with a significant number of offences. And then a wild rumour mill that was suggesting that there had been some deliberate effort to delay his extradition to the north of Ireland where he was to face these charges. And so it, it one fed into the other and it became a, a kind of very toxic mess. I think the only conclusion you can uh, make out from it is that it was both a, a simultaneous power play but also a huge mismanagement of a crisis by the then head of government, Mr. Reynolds himself, that, that, that it was a situation in rooms where you're 20 and 30 people going in and out of rooms and up corridors here and there with nobody really steering and managing the controversy itself. So the public became edgy and uneasy as did the media that something was here, there was something in this that people were hiding or, uh, or evading. So it was a classic political cock-up rather than a conspiracy. But of course, people at the time preferred to believe that there was some monstrous conspiracy behind it all. And of course, then uh, his attorney general was Harry Whelan, who had moved in relation to the X case, and he was then uh, appointed uh, president of the High Court. Yeah, and this was another part of this conflict that played out over a, a week and a half in the Dáil and outside. Was that the issue then became well, you know, to pacify his Labour coalition colleagues, could they get Harry Whelan to withdraw as the newly appointed president of the High Court, and that proved not forthcoming from um, Mr. Whelan, even though the court, the new Attorney General was sent up to his home to ask him would he consider this. He refused on the basis of the independence of the judiciary, etc. And so, you know, the whole thing became uh, fraught with disaster from a Reynolds perspective. And clearly, with being a foreign Labour having such a big majority and an available leader in the form of Bertie Hearn, there was a quick change with the expectation that Reynolds went out, but that he would be uh, replaced by a Hearn and he would form a government, a, p- a rather more peaceable sort of uh, a coalition arrangement with Labour. But Labour, in the end, were so spooked by the events of the Whelan uh, uh, priest affair that they, they pulled back from that. And there was an alternative in the House, and John Bruton was the lucky winner from this, and that the arithmetic in the Dáil allowed for Labour to change entirely and form a government with, with Fine Gael instead. So there was a, I think it was the first time we changed the government without an election ever happening. So that that was in itself momentous and a huge shock. Yeah, he was now out of of, of office, of course, back on the back benches. And you quote uh, from, I think it may be his um, his own uh, autobiography. I was no longer Taoiseach, no longer worth guarding, and my privileges would slowly be stripped away. I was so utterly exhausted by the long hours of the last few days, the sleepless nights, the mental agonies, the devastating situation, the emotion of the day, that I was now like a zombie on automatic pilot, completing the final ritual of my office, my resignation. I went home to Kathleen and closed the door on the world. That's right. And he didn't close the door long because he got then into a, a very elongated legal case against the Sunday Times, who'd written something he felt was libelous of his reputation in relation to their coverage of that particular crisis. And uh, 
he, he stuck it out in his typical home uh, and eventually actually won the case in, in material terms because he didn't have the huge cost to pay where he was on the hook for a million in legal costs at least if he hadn't won it. He eventually won it but it was perceived to be a half victory but you know, to Reynolds it was important in his eyes to, to clear his name of, of the implications that the Sunday Times had put out there about him. In 1997, he genuinely believed that he would be the Fianna Fáil candidate in the presidential election of that year, but he was, uh, well, I suppose it depends what angle you come at this, but uh, Mary McAleese was the candidate chosen by the the party. And, you know, we all remember Bertie Ahern looking at him and saying, I voted for you, look at my number one for you, but he, he didn't. Well, he did, he did vote for him in that ballot, obviously, but it seems that quite a significant cohort of people who had been sacked by Reynolds had taken matters into their own hands and, and decided they weren't backing Reynolds. So there, there seemed to be a, a sort of a counter-coup from within uh, the Reynolds, uh, the, the, not sorry, the Reynolds, the Hearn supporters are now in Wisconsin in government, and they, and they decided they weren't going to have Reynolds. And some of them... Uh, were taking the argument that it would resurface old wounds and arguments and scandals that had afflicted Fianna Fáil during the high era, including the beef trade, and, and that it was better to have a more conservative, if you like, candidate uh, who would, would not cause such disputes in, in, in the form of Mary McAleese. Did, did Bertie Ahern actually support him at the parliamentary party meeting? But he did. He showed his vote famously. Yes, that. The, but the famous <laughs> quotation uh, from from uh, one of our MEPs. He said promptly when he when he, he showed him the vote, that means you're finished, and I'm, and that's the polite way of putting it. Yes, there was another F word was used. But you know, some people were jaundiced and cynical about whether, in fact, he was supporting him or not. But I think what uh, Bert Aaron was saying was that he was he was formally voting for him. It may not have meant that his supporters were. Uh, and so, you know, that, that that caused a huge amount of bitterness, and I think in the sourness between the two men, between her and her, and for quite some time to come. Looking back now from this remove, Connor, um, and having written the book and uh, studied him closely, in his private life he found himself in various scraps as well with his brother and other businessmen, and in, in politics... Uh, something similar with Desmond O'Malley in relation to the uh, Beef Tribunal. Um, do, do, do you think, and of course with Dick, Dick Spring in relation to the appointment of uh, Harry Whelan to the uh, President of the High Court, but do you think that that might have been his downfall in many respects, that um, once he took up a position, he couldn't be uh, shifted from it? That's right, yeah. I think it's an entrepreneurial uh, streak that was in him. A lot of entrepreneurs, I've worked with Russian billionaires, Irish billionaires, and other uh, people in the business realm. And, and it seems, you know, that this kind of, we call it, you can call it pig iron or obstinacy or determination, is very much valued in the entrepreneur uh, as a person as a, who's a wealth creator and moving a business forward. But it's something that's, that doesn't always sit well in the political side of things. And I think Desley Hines said in, in an interview he gave to me that Albert's brain was fundamentally business rather than a political brain. And I think that there's a lot of sense in that when a friend says something like that, that he, he didn't have within his DNA and his makeup that, that sort of way of, of, how would you call it, making a major compromise. Or, you know, and there have also been other things, I think, within the, 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 the Labour coalition that, that have caused him annoyance. Uh, the briefing and the endless briefing against him by some sources in the Labour Party. So, you know, it was, it was a confluence of things. But I think, broadly speaking, in relation to Albert Reynolds, the very skills that made him a very successful business person uh, be, made, were a disadvantage when it came to running a coalition. But then they became a hugely prized uh, set of skill sets that he had when it came to bringing about the time-pressured results that happened in '94 with the IRA ceasefire and the law service. That actually his skill sets were made for that two to three year period where he, he delivered a huge result in terms of peace uh, on the island of Ireland. So, you know, it, it's an irony in a way that the very skill set that, that make you bad at running a coalition become very good in a very limited time span when 
a, a certain danger said different things had to be done and he did them and, and embraced danger and embraced risk rather than was overly cautious about how he'd approach the peace process. Yeah, you conclude uh, the book by referring to that uh, perhaps most impressive of all your writers were the per- personal risks Reynolds was prepared to take for peace. That's right. That's right. He, he was an extraordinary man, really. I mean, he, we may not see it again in Irish politics. Hopefully we will see some space for that kind of risk-taking and big thinking and, and, and really going for things. Uh, it would be nice to think our political system will be able to uh, adapt uh, that particular element of risk taking into the more into the political system. I feel now I I able to have a personal opinion that we need more entrepreneurs in the political system. Very good. Well, um, it's book. The book is Albert Reynolds, uh, Risk Taker for Peace by Conor Lenehan. And Conor, really, really grateful to you that you gave us uh, 45 minutes, 46 minutes to go through what has been a very interesting period in Irish political history. Many thanks indeed for joining us on the programme this evening. Thank you very much. It's been the longest interview I've done and I have to thank you for, for really putting me on, on, on the spot. So thank you very much. Not at all. Thank you very much indeed, Conor Lenehan, uh, the author of that book, uh, Albert Reynolds, Risk Taker for Peace. Brings the time to 13 minutes to 6 o'clock. We'll take a break.